Hi, this is John McDonald from ProScott. Um, if you've had a chance to look at any of my post-test videos, you'll know that we've made videos for people who have passed their motorcycle test. And this is now a series of videos that we're going to make now for those that are still to do their motorcycle test. We're going to start off, first of all, with the CBT, Compulsory Basic Training, and then we'll be moving on to a series of videos for direct access as well. So, first thing to say is, there's my badge, John McDonald, okay? So I'm a qualified for delivering CBTs and also qualified for delivering direct access. Uh, also a little bit more quickly about myself, just in case my own qualifications have been called in. I started up Pro Scott in 1996. I'm a driving instructor, a motorcycle instructor, I'm a trainer of trainers, I'm on the audit register, do fleet corporate work and a whole range of other stuff from LTS right through to advanced race motorbikes for a number of years as well. Uh, very, very quickly here, we have a new thing called the standards check. Well, I say new, it's relatively new. Um, the standards check. Here's the one for my audit inspection, which means I train the trainers, as you'll see here. Uh, three's all the way down, 51 out of 51. Uh, zero to 42 is an unsatisfactory. Uh, 43 to 51, high overall standard, etc., etc., grade A. So I'm a grade A, 51 out of 51 for my audit which basically means the training of driving instructors for cars from a grade A for car you have to actually be a grade A before you can be considered for audit uh, and also as one that I suppose you're more interested in here's my CBT my latest CBT one which was done on the 1st of uh, December uh, sorry the 12th of January is back to front 12th of January 2020 which was this year uh, from my CBT assessment where again you'll see straight trees and again another 51 at 51 the examiner said, John presented two mature male trainees with no previous motorcycle experience who had already attended uh, the ATB for previous training sessions. Well, we do an introductory class for anyone pre-CBT that's maybe a little bit nervous, worried about it. Um, it doesn't replace anything that we cover in the CBT, but we call it our introductory class. It's a two-hour class. You can find out more about that on our website. And it says here that when the DVSA examiner arrived on the site, the group were partway through element C which is the yard stuff, I'll explain all the elements in a moment. Uh, John conducted the lessons in a very professional manner, allowing the trainees to engage at every opportunity with excellent client-centered learning techniques. All the exercises were comprehensively briefed, ensuring the trainees were in no doubt as to what was expected. John was compassionate um, and patient towards the trainees when the tasks seemed to be getting the better of them. Accurate and honest feedback was given to the trainees throughout the session. The weather conditions were not kind, well it was January of course, I remember it was snowing, it started snowing anyway, and John was able to keep the trainees uh, motivated throughout the session. Congratulations John, a very professional lesson under uh, extremely difficult circumstances, and that was Davy Forsyth who carried out that assessment. And again, you'll see again, 51 out of 51, and there's your levels. Uh, an instructor that scores less than 30 is an unsatisfactory performance. 31 to 42 is a satisfactory performance, that would get you what's called the grade B. And 43 to 51, a high overall standard of instruction demonstrated with 51. So, the reason I'm pointing that bit out is sometimes uh, when you do things like this, your questions and experience are, uh, are questioned. So, just to let you know that I am qualified to stand here and actually give this presentation. Okay, so what happens in the CBT? Well, we're doing this, as you can see here, Pro Scott will let me know. But this is, should be pretty standard right across the board. If you were going to the .gov website and actually looking at what's in a CBT, for all the elements, and I'll explain them to you in a moment, you should find that all schools are doing pretty much the same things, right? And it's pretty consistent standard that's laid down and framework for us all to stick to. Um, so the first thing is that when you're booking in, we get different people with different backgrounds. We get people who have never ridden motorcycles before. Some people have ridden motorcycles before. Some people are completely provisional license holders. Some people also say with full car license. So we can get a real mixture of abilities of people coming in to do the CBT. The CBT, as I'll explain to the moment, is the basic level of training. That's where it starts. There's nothing that replaces that, even our introductory class. There's nothing we can do in our introductory class that would replace anything that takes place in the compulsory basic training. So first things first, we uh, we 
we the office will do this or we get you to do this we'll get you to uh, go and get a check code which basically means using your uh, license number and your national insurance number to give us a check code this means that on the day when you come in we not only check your license but we'll also check the code um, uh, using a little browser device here and we can check just to make sure that you've still got um, a valid license and that there's not any extra endorsements being put on it that would effectively make your license null and void so we have to check that first of all so we do a license check, uh, we'll check your license and as part of element A, which I'm going to explain in a moment, we'll also be checking your eyesight as well. Okay, we'll check your eyesight too. So, there we go. Uh, when you come in, uh, we'll, we'll do the meet and greet. So we'll meet you first of all. We start at 8 o'clock in the morning. Different people have different start times, but we start our CBTs at 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, uh, once we bring you in, we'll do the meet and greet. Uh, first of all, as I say, checking uh, licenses and usually we check your eyesight at that point to be honest when you come in and we'll get you first of all as a group just have a, a wee quick chat amongst yourselves and get you to kind of relax a little bit and um, we will also get you to just introduce yourself we'll introduce ourselves the instructor but also introduce yourselves to us so we can find out a little bit about more about your background the girls will have asked you this or the office anyway will have asked you about your background so we'll have a bit of an idea but we'll ask a little bit more just to find out what kind of experience you really have and then we get an idea of the ex uh, experience we've got within the, within the group so um let's look now then uh at proscop proscop was started up in 1996 uh We've been running now then, as you can see then, for this is going to be our 24th uh, year running as a school. And we do everything from motorcycle training right through to advanced. We also do track stuff as well. Uh, we've got a background in motorcycle racing. I've been multiple Scottish champion racing motorcycles. And we do everything in cars, right from junior driver, pre-driver age training, right through to LTS training, right through to advanced. And we do fleet corporate stuff beyond that as well. So we're, we're heavily involved then in all aspects pretty much of driver, rider and driver training so let's look at the screen here i've got lewis my son here assisting me um apologies for the hairdo uh, this was done at a time called lockdown <laughs> so a lot of people know what that means in the future when we look back at these videos but it basically means i'm not being able to get my hair cut for a while so here we are i'm going to have a look at the first bit here for you first of all and um, the compulsory basic training there are five elements the day is going to be split up into five elements um, element A, B, C, D and E and I'm going to explain each of the elements just now and give you a basic overview of the CBT. So we're doing an introduction just now which we're doing just now. Now I should say that when you come in on the day if you've been watching these videos um, we'll use, you heard me using the term there, client-centred learning. Well, we used to use quite traditional instructors were quite traditional back in the day. That meant they sort of told you everything. They were the fountain of all knowledge. You just had to sit there and gratefully receive that knowledge. So they told you what to do, they told you the faults you did, they told you why it was wrong, they told you the dangers and then they told you what to do to fix it. Now it's very much what we call client centred. That means pitching the lesson to suit your needs and your ability. So if you're coming as a CBT renewal, for example, we can move through things quicker than someone that's coming as a complete novice for uh, obvious reasons. The same as the style that's used by the instructor now is more of a kind of a coaching style where we want to engage you and take an active part in the learning process. What does this mean? Well, it means we want you to think and reflect yourself. Uh, anything that we do that way, you're going to remember far better than if we were just sitting there preaching. But remember, this is a presentation that I'm giving here as opposed to a training session. So it's hard for me to ask you questions when you're sitting at a video screen. So I'm going to be presenting here. But bearing in mind that when you do come in, uh, hopefully you've watched these videos uh, covering all the elements. And it means that when you do come in on the day, our instructors are going to be able to move through certain elements a bit quicker than they can do normally. That doesn't mean that anything's going to be missed out. Um, what it does mean though is it means that we can focus on the elements that we feel are more important. For example, element C, which I'm going to explain in a moment, which is the yard training, getting the, the bike control skills. We'd rather spend more time on the bike controlled skills and we'd rather spend more time on the road. Two hours is the minimum time on the road. If we can spend longer, we will spend longer on the road with you, especially if it's needed as well. So the theory sessions, we like to get through them a bit quicker. That's why hopefully me making these videos is going to help you to get a good understanding of what's in those sessions so that when you do come in, the instructor is able to use more of a coaching style, which is asking you the questions and providing we can see that you've got the, the, uh, an appropriate level of knowledge and understanding, we can move things on. So we don't have to labor points in the classroom. All right, so that's the reason for me making these videos as well. So let's have a look then at what's in element uh, A, the introduction to begin with. Well, first of all, the CBT was introduced in 1990, 1990 to reduce accidents. Prior to that, we had an old thing called part one, which was really just 
off-road, a bit of off-road skills. There wasn't any on-road training. And prior to that, believe it or not, there wasn't anything at all. You just applied for a provisional license and you were let loose. Now, that's how it was back in my day. And you could ride up to a 250cc on L plates. Pretty scary. These were bikes that were uh, capable of... Uh, getting on for about 100 mile per hour with absolutely no training and uh, I was one of them, I had a little 50cc moped and then was able to move on to that size of bike, just purely nail plates. Nowadays of course you've got to complete at least the minimum which is a CBT first of all before you can ride out on the road with your 125 or your 50cc moped. So it was introduced to reduce accidents. Um, it is a continuous assessment, what does that really mean? It means that throughout the day it's not a test as such that we will be assessing your ability and moving things at your pace. That's why it's called client-centered learning. Um, the legal requirements are, if you're uh, 50, if you're age 16, you can't ride anything bigger than your moped. If you're 17 or over, though, you can get yourself in a 125cc, up to 14.6 brake horsepower, and your L plates must be displayed front and rear, not cut down, incidentally. You can't carry a filming passenger, and you can't go in a motorway. So, in effect, this CBT validates the uh, provisional portion of your license. Um, now, <clears throat> some people are going to go on and just use their CBT purely to ride back and forth, either on a 50cc moped at 16 or their 125. Um, some people will want to go on and do the motorcycle test. If they want to go on and do the motorcycle test, you still need to have a valid CBT certificate. Um, along with a theory pass certificate to be able to go on and then do your module one and eventually your module two test. So the CBT is where it starts, whether you just want to ride a 125 or where you want to get something bigger. Um, once the uh, certificate is, uh, is issued, once you're competent in all those five elements that I mentioned, I'm going to give you an overview of them in a moment. So once you're competent in all areas, you'll get your CBT certificate. Um, the CBT certificate is valid for two years from the date of issue. Uh, and as it said, it covers the provisional portion of your license. The CBT includes both off-road and on-road training. And when we say off-road, we don't mean we're going to get you flying across the bing with your motocross bike. Uh, no, it just means in our training yard, an off-road area. Because if you think about it, unlike a car where you have a driving instructor sat beside you with a set of dual controls, um, we don't have that. Or when we go out on the road later on for element E, all we can do is talk to you on the radio. And we need to make sure that you have the bike control skills at that point so we can talk to you on the radio. So you need to be able to, as you're going to be showing at the moment, have the basic riding skills to enable you to get out on the road. So that's why it's got off-road and on-road training combination of. So um, let's look at the different elements and what we're going to cover in different elements. Well, like we said there, that when you come in an element A to begin with, you do the license checks, we'll do the meet and greet, we'll do the eyesight check with you, um, we'll give you the overview of the CBT, what's going to happen, uh, we'll be covering equipment and clothing, but we'll also do in addition to that is you'll be shown any health and safety things like for example the fire escape, uh, should the place burst into flames, we'll be shown where the toilets are, the, the water um, for a drink, things like that, keep yourself hydrated through the day. So there are some things that we need to cover in addition to the basics of what would be on element A. And as I say that, meet and greet is very important, getting you to relax at the start. So that's all done in A and I'm going to be going through element A just now where you're particularly um, looking at the equipment and clothing in a moment. And as I say, testing your eyesight. Um, next thing, uh, in element B. Uh, now, how long does element A take? Anything between 30 minutes and 45 minutes, typically. Typically. Now, if you're watching this video, uh, then hopefully we can get that down to about 30 minutes, which means more time on the bike. Remember, if you're giving the right answers, we can move things on if we're asking you, because we want to coach you. What does coaching mean? Rather than preaching to you, like I'm doing just now, we'll be asking. And if you're giving us the right information, then we're going to move it on. So in section B, in uh, element B, so that's um, 30 to 45 minutes. Now, we start at 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, again, for B, again, that's typically anything between 30 to 45 minutes, although there's no time limit on it, it's typically around about 30 to 45 minutes, depending on how quickly you're picking things up. Again, if you're watching my video, hopefully we'll get through things a bit quicker. We'll introduce you to the bike, make sure you're familiar with the bike, the location and function of the controls. We'll be looking at um, roadworthiness checks and maintenance checks and basic daily checks that you should carry out on your bike to make sure it's legal and it's roadworthy and that it's fit for the purpose. Um, we're not trying to turn you into mechanics here, but we do want to make sure that you can identify if your bike's legal roadworthy and it's safe to ride on the road. We'll be showing you how to use the stands, the side stand, centre stand. Uh, we'll be showing you how to walk with the bike, manual handling of your motorcycle. And we'll also be showing you how to stop and start the engine and how to wheel the bike around as well. Alright, so that's all in element B. Now we're going to be doing a separate video 
and, and B. This is really A, the overview. We'll be doing a separate video for element B. Uh, and again, as I say, after that one, we'll be moving on to C. This is where we're going to develop the basic riding skills that you're going to need out on the road and we'll develop them in the yard. You could probably already work out what some of these are. This is where I'd be asking people, typically coach and saying what sort of skills do you think you need to run in our land before we could take you on the road. we are no surprised to find here, moving off and stopping, one of the very first skills that you're going to be learning. We start off moving off and stopping in a straight line, then we'll build in observations, but initially we'll just get you moving off and stopping in a straight line. Now, if you've ridden motorcycles before, of course, we might not need to give an explanation and a demonstration. We can maybe just move straight into it. So see, this is what I mean about client-centered. The rate that the CBT progresses it is based on your knowledge, your experience, and your ability. So you're gonna to have to know how to move off and stop. You're gonna to have to know how to change gears. You're gonna to have to know how to carry out rear observations, which is a combination of mirror and rearward glances. Now for car drivers, some of this stuff, I think, well, I know how to move off and stop in a car, and I know how to change gear in a car, and I know how to check my mirrors in a car. So no surprise to find then, there's a lot of what we call skills transfer. That is where you're transferring the knowledge that you already as a car driver over to the bike. Because you're about to find out when we do element B, a lot of the controls are very, very similar. We have a throttle instead of an accelerator. We have uh, brakes as well, a front brake and a rear brake. Uh, we have a clutch. We have a gearbox, exactly the same. So once you get the concept of a car driving, then you can transfer that very, very quickly to the concept of motorcycles. It's a bit harder, admittedly, for those that are complete novices, never driven a car before and have no experience. Uh, what else are we going to do in the yard? We're going to be teaching you slow speed riding skills and steering skills and manoeuvres. And for us, we do slow speed riding. We also do slalom. It's not so much that's in the CBT, but it's a nice lead in to figure of eight and U turn, which we do. And it's also, if you're going to do the bike test, great lead in to the bike test, which does cover slalom where you're slamming through the cones. Like we said, we also do figure of eights and we do U turn. So that's all sort of slow speed control maneuverability exercises. Um, we'll be teaching how to use the brakes, back brake, rear brake, front brake and both brakes together. We'll be explaining to you the percentages and how much you use those brakes depending on the situations. For example, slow speed riding is rear brake only. As the speeds get faster, your front brake is the most powerful brake. You've got your engine brake, you've got your rear brake and then you've got your front brake and that's in order of power of the brake. Um, and as the speeds increase, you use a combination of front and rear brakes, and we'll be showing you how those percentages work for dry surfaces, wet surfaces, but we're going to cover more of that when we start looking at element uh, B and element C. Uh, we'll also be doing simulated junction work in the yard. So these skills here then are the skills that we need to ensure that you can go out safely on the road. Um, element D, on-road talks, yep. Uh, we'll have a chart out in the road to get you ready to go on the road. We're covering all the fee for what to expect out in the road. And then we'll be covering the on-road riding itself. That's a minimum of two hours out in the road. We've got to cover things like junctions, crossroads, roundabouts, traffic lights, pedestrian crossings, um, emergency stops, U-turns, gradients, obstructions, and we'll also do uh, riding on the bends as well. So there you go. There's a, a complete overview of all the elements. Typically, as I say, 30 to 45 minutes for A. Typically, 30 to 45 minutes for B. C depends on the students. We've had students coming in CBT renewal can get through the whole lot of that in, in an hour. We've had other people doing three hours that's never ridden before. And typically, uh, three hours is, 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 is average, I would say, for someone that's never ridden before to get through all of that. Um, especially if the car driver got up and, and picking up fairly quickly, two and a half to three hours typically. Some people might not get through element C on their first visit and they have to come back again. That's why we do a guaranteed CBT where we don't charge you any more for your second visit. Your on-road talks, again, typically 30 to 45 minutes, and E, the on-road riding, again, uh, you're on the road for a minimum of two hours, but we like to get out early if we can, so we can spend more time than that with you if possible. We want to enhance your skills. Everything that you do in A, B, C, and D is to really allow you to get on the road for ease. That's the most important one. So, let's um, look now at equipment and clothing. We're going to talk now about equipment and clothing, and I'm not going to preach to you too long here. I've just brought up helmets, so let's we pop around here now. We're going to cover helmets now and talk about helmets. Now, Remember, I'm not trying to preach to you here. I'm just going to give you an overview of the clothing and why it's so important. But you could probably work most of this out for yourself. Um, the helmet, for example, is the only piece of clothing that legally that you're actually required to wear. You could go out there with nothing else on. You'll probably get done for it in decent exposure. But the helmet is the thing that you must wear by law. So I'm going to spend uh, a little bit of time just covering the helmet. And then I'm going to talk about the other protection areas. Of course, we're going to be protecting the trunk, the legs, the feet and the hands. Now. Just give you a quick overview. You could probably work this out already. We live in Scotland, it can get very cold. So you're gonna need clothing that can keep you warm. But equally, it can get very hot. 
So you need some means of regulating temperature, maybe opening up the vents, letting the air flow through. Now if you think about in a car, you can adjust temperature. So on a motorbike, we need some means of adjusting temperature. We can do that by putting extra layers of clothing in, or thermal linings in, or taking thermal linings out. We can put waterproof linings in, we can take them out. We can put waterproofs over the top, etc. So we can kind of adjust the, the temperature by the clothing that we buy and what we do with that clothing, flexible clothing. So temperature regulation is very important because if you're too hot, it's affecting your concentration, but if you're too cold, it's going to affect your concentration. Equally, the clothing is going to provide you abrasion protection. If you're sliding along the road, we don't want to leave the skin line on it. So your clothing has to give you abrasion protection. Next thing, impact protection. If you're hitting solid objects with elbow, shoulders, head, etc., you want impact um, protection. So we're keeping warm, we're keeping dry, abrasion protection and impact protection. And your clothing really should provide you with that level of protection. Now, I could pretty much stop at that point, but that really is, your clothing should provide you with that. Because remember, when you're in a car, you've got this shell round about you providing you with that protection. It's keeping you warm, it's keeping you dry, it's preventing you from impact and abrasion protection by this cocoon. You don't have that in a motorbike. You're relying on your clothing. Now, ideally, your defensive riding skills and your good riding skills is going to save you, hopefully, from impact and abrasion. But when it comes to keeping warm, keeping dry, it doesn't matter how good a rider you are, you can't dodge the cold and you can't dodge the showers. So, let's now then look, Lewis, fairly quickly then at the helmet side of it. Um, the helmets that you're going to get are going to come, as you can see here, in all different um, uh, colours. You've got bright coloured helmets, you've got dark coloured helmets here. Um, they're going to come in different standards, which we're going to look at in a moment, different standard helmet as well. We're looking at EC2205 as the standard helmet that we're actually going to be looking at nowadays. We used to have different old British standards for helmets as well. Um, and so let's have a look at our little screen then over here, Lewis, and just quickly sort of start to flick through uh, the helmets and what wraps the same for the helmet. So let's head back over and just flick through them. So first thing to say then is that when you look at the helmets, you're going to get different styles, all right? You're going to get an open face helmet and a full face helmet. So let's just bring up a picture for that fairly quickly. There's your open face. As you can see here, full facial protection. Here, as you can see, open protection. Now, let's just pop back up here again very, very quickly. Here's one typical open face helmet. People who get claustrophobic might like this sort of helmet, but as you can see, no facial protection here. You can either have the visor pulled down or you can have goggles on it. There's a full face helmet, as you can see, full facial protection. Here's your helmet that's really just a full face helmet with what's called the flip at the front. Um, quite versatile. So that's your three main styles of helmet. Pop back over again then, Lewis. Um, helmet construction, I'm not going to spend too long talking on this one really, but your polycarbonate's really a plastic outer shell of a short here, that's like your outer shell around the outside. Your glass fibre, stronger material, but heavier material. Your Kevlar carbon fibre, these are more exotic, lightweight materials and they tend to increase the price of the actual helmet. Then you've got the, which is outer shell. Then you've got your protective padding underneath. This is this bit here. Now that's designed in an impact and a crash. That outer shelf flexes in, compresses all this here. And if you sustained another hefty knock in that area, it's going to go straight, straight to your skull. That's why we say if the helmet's sustained a hefty knock or a blow, it should be replaced. There is, of course, the comfort padding as well. You can see here, there's probably another bit missing. Yeah, there we go there, the comfort padding. So there's a helmet cut through, all right? It gives you an idea of the, the three layers, the outer shell, uh, your protective padding in the middle and then your comfort padding. And this is an old plastic one that we've cut open just to show you. All right. Now it goes from cheapest helmet to more expensive helmets as you can see there. All right. Now the helmet care, well just clean it if you're cleaning your helmet, clean it with either manufacturer approved uh, proper helmet cleaning for helmets and visors. Don't go trying to clean it with household detergents or anything like that it could cause damage. And again, if a helmet has got stickers uh, or paint or anything on it, it should be uh, approved by the manufacturer. Don't go painting it with your own paint and putting your own stickers on it. Again, it can damage the outer shell, weaken the structure. And if a helmet, as you can see here, if it's sustained a hefty blow or a knock, it is designed for that shell to flex and it could have caused damage. Damage that might not necessarily be visible and uh, in which case the helmet should be replaced. So try and look after your helmet. Never buy a second hand helmet because you just don't know what's like what's happened to it in a previous life. Something might cause damage to it and give it a quick paint, for example. Um, lifespan, we say five to eight years, but it really depends on how, how you use it, how you look after your helmets. There's not a lifespan as such. 
but you'll know when your helmet's needing replaced, you'll start to feel things are getting a bit worn, the padding might be coming worn, etc. If the visors are scratched, which I'll mention in a moment, they can be replaced, uh, the helmet will tend to outlast the visors, although nowadays they don't tend to scratch as easy as they did in the olden days. Helmet fit's very, very important. When you put a helmet on, put on the shop for a wee while first. Um, don't be frightened to walk about with it a while. If you're feeling any tightness in any particular area, it's probably telling you that that helmet's not right for you. Put it on the front or at the back or on the top. It should not feel nice and balanced all the way, a nice comfortable fit. I give my head a quick shake from side to side, it should move with it. I move the chin piece for example, it should move the skin. If it's sliding freely over the top, it's probably too loose. Now you could buy a really expensive helmet, but if it's too slack on your head, it ain't no good. So if you're doing shoulder checks, lifesavers, and it's wobbling about and vibrating on your head, it ain't good, good. So too slack can come off an accident, too tight though, and it's gonna affect your concentration. Also when you put the helmet on, you make sure it's securely fastened. Make sure you can only get uh, two fingers in, not any more than that, okay? Now, there's my uh, own race helmet that I've shown here, the EC2205, remember I said the standards? We used to have all British standards, various standards, type B, type A, green stickers, blue stickers, you'll hardly see any of these now, that would be a really old helmet if you saw that. The ones that we're really interested in now is the EC2205, the same goes for the visors as well. Um, and this one here, the gold stamp, just means it's been approved for motorcycle sport by ECU. So there's your proof safety, EC2205, and uh, there's your ACU Motorsport uh, there. Don't buy any helmets that's not been properly approved. I go for named helmets. I wouldn't buy anything off eBay that's not a named helmet. You don't know where it is. This is a very light one at 1,250 grams. That's my full race carbon fibre helmet that I've just taken a photograph of there. Um, so, um, basically the brighter... Uh, we'll just click through all this one here. Oops, go back one John. Um, you can see here, what we're saying is that the brighter that your helmet is, the easier it's going to be to see, to see. We're also saying here that if you're wearing any fluorescent clothing as well and reflective strips, that's going to make you more visible as well. And we're not only trying to make ourselves visible from the front and the rear, but also from the side. So ask yourself, are you visible? If you look here, the rider on the right here is kind of disappearing. If you look at the clothing there, I've put the dark clothing on this side, Lewis, you can see the dark helmet, dark jacket, etc. That's all dark over this side, Lewis, we see the bright colours over here. Look, the bright coloured helmet, the dark coloured helmet. So remember, if you're going for a brighter coloured helmet, that's going to make you more visible. Now, you'll find out later on in the videos, they reckon it can reduce one third of all accidents just by making yourself visible. Look at the clothing here, for example, as well, yeah? Um, and you see the different colours. I'm going to talk about the materials a bit more in a moment. So, that's a little bit then about the, the helmets there. Now we're going to look at how we fasten those helmets. Um, you've got the, the two D-ring system where you pass through the two D-rings, come in between them and pull it tight. I like this tight because it adjusts every single time. This is your quick release like your seatbelt tight. I'll be honest, I don't quite like them so much. Any moving parts that can fail worry me. Also, through time they can come a little bit loose and you have to re-tighten them again. I really do like this tight, but that's still, if I've used this tight, the barren buckle, you'll hardly see any of them now. That's why we call that old style. Um, as it says there, never use a damaged helmet, never ride without a helmet, and never ride with the helmet undone. Uh, are not properly fastened, all right? There are certain groups that can, uh, by law, are allowed to uh, to ride on the road without a helmet. And so there you go, all right? Now, visors and goggles, very, very quickly with visors and goggles, which is part of the helmet. Again, this is them over here, Lewis. You want to get good facial, uh, good protection, as you can imagine here. The helmet was keeping you warm, it should keep you dry. It should offer a breeze and an impact protection. Your visor, therefore, is going to be protecting your eyes, isn't it? Let's look at the sort of thing. You could probably, I'd be asking questions here, but you can imagine the sort of protection that's going to um, protect your eyes from grip, flying insects, etc., stones getting flung up on the road, raining, etc. So it's really designed to protect your eyes. It becomes scratched, it's going to affect your visibility. Um, I'm not going to say things that's in my PowerPoint presentation here and jumping ahead of myself. So, boom, boom, let's jump back across the list. Um, so visors and goggles then, um, as you can see here, this would be used on an open face helmet, the, the goggles. This is more your full face helmet here, uh, helmet to be used. Again, they've got the European standard on them. As we said, protecting you from wind, rain, insects and road dirt is, the, is its job. Um, if it's damaged, scratched, it should be replaced, of course. Um, tints, tinted visors um, will stay specifically not during the hours of darkness and the black is illegal racetrack only. Most helmets nowadays, I'll just put over here again, Lewis, quickly, I've got this, which is a great feature, the drop down visor inside so you can drop that down and that retracts back up again that's great um, as well since i'm here that's a pin lock i'm going to mention it in a moment all right since we're there jump back again lewis back over here um 
your ratchet, well it's got a ratchet system where the, the, the visor can click up in stages and that's great especially when you're stationary for just popping up a little bit to help it to demist so it doesn't steam up. Once you're on the move you've got vents that flow in and help demist the helmet when you're on the move but when you're stationary or in very slow moving traffic cracking the visor open slightly at the bottom helps it to demist. Wouldn't advise opening it up fully of course because then you could get a problem with foreign objects pinging into your eyes or in, hitting your face. Um, when you're cleaning them, like the helmet, just clean with mild soap and water or proper approved cleaners. Don't go trying to clean with detergents, again it can damage the visor. And a glove wipe is just basically a, wipe, a glove that's got a, a, a facility to wipe the visor clean. Um, Anti-mist sprays um, uh, can help them demist. Pin lock, I just said it now, it's just like a double, um, like double glazing. It's an extra layer that sits inside the visor and protects you from the cold outside to the warm air inside and helps stop your breath. Uh, from condensing back onto the visor. Very, very effective. I've used them for, for a few years now at the racing and we mentioned there the vents to help you from misting up as well, which get a free flow of air up on the visor and through the head uh, and cool your head as well. Visor and goggles then. Never clean them with solvents. We said that. Household cleaners or petrol. Now, the next section, I'm just going to have a quick overview of this and then just show it very, very quickly. Um, gloves, as you can imagine, is to protect your hands. You're going to have boots to protect your feet and your ankles and shins. You're going to have the trousers to protect your legs. And you're going to have your jacket, really, to protect here. So let's just go quickly, Liz, because I'm aware of the time we've gone on for this video. Um, let's just show quickly the sort of different types of protection you've got here. And then we'll just see the PowerPoint presentation to make sure that we're kind of covering it. Let's first of all go to gloves, Lewis. You've got these light kind of summer gloves. You've got this kind of mid-season kind of gloves, the three-season glove. And then you've got the thicker kind of winter gloves, short gloves, long gloves. You've got leather gloves, you've got textile. Textile is just a gen generic name for this type of material as opposed to leather. And you get different types of textile from kind of your nylon, your polyester, which is more your entry level kind of stuff. And then moving on to kind of cordura and kevlar, which are textiles but harder wearing, more abrasive, for example. So you've got different styles of gloves from summer gloves, three season gloves and your winter gloves. Short gauntlet style, uh, short style and longer style. I always like a style that overlaps. So there's your, there. If you look up here, Lewis, different types of boots. You know, these, these here are what I call the kind of casual range boots. Up the top here, shorter kind of casual range boots. There's casual kind of clothing down here as well nowadays. Um, you can create that kind of casual look on the bike with the Kevlar. It looks like an ordinary pair of jeans. That's Kevlar jeans. A lot more abrasive, the same with the shirt as well. Um, Stepping along with the boots there, we showed the shorter boots, but I've actually got underneath here, this is a longer boot, the same as that, it's a longer boot. So you see it's pro providing a lot more protection on the ankles, the boot, etc, the, the shin and the whole leg. I've raced motorbikes long enough to appreciate the protection of good equipment. So there you go then, different types of boots from little shorter boots. If you're now coming for your test, you must have at least the ankles covered. Um, and uh, as I say, these are shorter boots, you get uh, mid-length boots and then the full-length boots as well. We mentioned the gloves there. Protecting the trunk, well again, you get jackets, short jackets like this, three quarter kind of length jackets, um, your textile sort of trousers here, your leather jeans like what I've got on here, yeah, one piece suits underneath there, I think I've got a one piece leather suit, yeah, that's one of my race suits, so there's a, a one piece leather suit there. So different types and different clothing. Now depending on the type of riding you're going to do, you might be an adventure rider, which means you might go more for this type of clothing, more like the adventure sort of colour, that can sometimes be grey, they're kind of colour, they tend to go for the adventure riders. You could be more kind of sports orientated, leaning maybe perhaps a little bit more to the kind of leather wear, etc. Or a commuter who's going more for this type of jacket, more your kind of nylon type of jacket, more entry level kind of stuff. So in other words, you buy the clothing that one suits your budget, the type of bike that you're going to be riding and the type of riding you're going to be doing. Are you doing all year round riding? Are you just going to be a fair weather summer rider? If I was going out in leathers, for example, which provide great abrasion protection, I'd want to back that up with either an extra layer underneath that was cold or waterproof over the top. And there's different waterproofs that you can pull over. There's fluorescent ones, jackets that can go over the top, the trousers, yeah, they can go over the top of leathers. There's the same idea again, but they're just black, not going to be nearly as visible. Remember we mentioned the brighter the colour of the clothing, the more it's going to stand out. And reflective strips like this light up at night. So fluorescent's great during the daytime and your reflective more for your nighttime stuff. Um, so let's have a look and see now what it's saying kind of about the protection here. We'll get this one fairly quickly. The gloves, as we said, keep your hands warm and dry. If your hands are cold, you're not going to be able to operate the controls. You're not going to be concentrating. It puts you at high risk. 
It's going to protect you if you fall, for abrasion protection, keeping you dry as well, hopefully for waterproof gloves, helps you to operate the controls. Um, reducing the risk of injury, we said that. Leather's not waterproof and it's not, unless it specifically says it is, i.e. with a waterproof lining. Um, Aqua gloves are just waterproof gloves. Over mitts, uh, well, these are things that can go over the top like this, and they can go over the top of your gloves. Don't look particularly nice, but my gosh, they're good for keeping you warm, keeping you dry, if it's a particularly bad day. The same as inner gloves inside. Not so keen on them because if it makes your gloves too tight, an air gap can be one of the best things for keeping your hands warm. Um, so as it says here, never ride without your gloves. Now in a motorcycle test, you must turn up with actual motorcycle gloves. All right? You can't turn up uh, unless it's actually motorcycle gloves. Now everything that we just said for gloves, guess what? Applies to boots. So very, very quickly, let's just go through the presentation. It reduces the risk of injury to your feet, your ankles, or calf, as you would expect. Um, keeps your feet warm, keeps them dry, as you'd expect. Um, leather, we said it's not waterproof unless it's specifically lined. And the Aqua Boot is a waterproof boot. So if it specifically says it's waterproof, then obviously that's what it's going to do for you. Um, over boots, well, you get things like this, rubber over boots that you can pull over the top. I used to say that polythene bags do the same job and they're free, but they're not the five pence now. But even just waterproof um, bags over the top can, can help your feet as well, keep them dry. Um, so as with um, the gloves, never ride without them and never ride in sandals, shoes, or trainers. Now protecting trunk very very quickly protecting the trunk everything that we've said for for the for the boots and for the, the the gloves also goes for protecting the trunk so same thing so let's just see it different types of material where we mentioned them. Leather is the best for abrasive qualities that's why you see a MotoGP riders using them and um, so leather offers the best abrasive qualities especially if it's a quality brand that you're using. Your Textile, remember we said that's just a generic name for that type of material, different types, polyester, nylon, more your entry level kind of stuff, and then moving up to your cordure and Kevlar, more expensive, more abrasive qualities. Um, um, your wax cotton, uh, quite popular with those that want to create the retro scene um, as well. So these are different types of kind of materials. Um, different styles we mentioned, you know, waistcoat, three quarter length, Trousers, bib and brace, one piece suits, all one. Your racers, for example, have an all piece suit because any suit's only as good as its weakest point. And in the case of a two piece suit, that's always going to be the join. Um, the level of protection, keep me warm, keep me dry, abrasion protection, and of course your impact protection. So if we look down here, oh, I thought I had them sitting in the floor. Yes, I do. There's a, a typical uh, impact protection. Now they're going to be typically on the, the knees, on the hips. Um, on the shoulders, the elbows, and on the back. And you'll see that it actually has got CE approved stamped on it as well. All right, and that's just designed to spread the load of the, of the impact. So your clothing then to recap, your clothing should keep you warm, but not so much keep you warm, it should regulate temperature. Be able to open up vents, for example, the air in, should be able to take linings out um, if it's too hot. Um, be able to put linings back in if it's cold, close vents up, put extra lining in. So in other you can adjust the temperature, of your, the, the, the temperature of your core temperature effectively on your clothing. Um, you want to be able to keep dry, so if the suit itself or the clothing you've got is not waterproof, then back it up with some sort of waterproof oversuit that not only keeps you dry, that helps keep the wind out as well. Abrasion resistance, well we did say that uh, you want your, your uh, gear to provide good abrasion. If you're sliding along the road, you don't want to leave your skin line on the road. So good abrasion resistance, and we said that leather's the best for that one. Remember, any clothing is only as good as its weakest point. Um, and impact protection, we said as well, see approved impact protection. So if you do knock any areas, it spreads the load, it spreads the impact. All right. Um, prices, just showing them up quickly here, and run through them for air. We're almost at the end of the presentation. Textile leather jackets end typically from 80 to 300 upwards. Textile leather trousers end from 80 to 300 upwards. Leather suits end from 500 to 1000 pound upwards. Nylon jackets end from 50 to 100 pound. Nylon trousers 10 pound to 50 pound for nylon trousers. Nylon oversuit 40 pound to 100 pound. Gloves 20 to 80 quid typically can be more of course. Boots 60 to 250 can be more of course. Helmets 50. To 600 pounds. We also now get what we call airbag suits now start to come in and also airbags that you can buy as well that in the event of an accident can inflate and help protect the ride as well. Very quickly now just to bring this section to a close for element A. Um, if you can't afford motorcycle clothing then these are 
the minimum that the DVSA suggests. The trunk should be protected by something like heavy denim or equivalent. Several layers underneath, so if you were involved in an accident, it can buff through. Same with the legs, heavy denim or, or some equivalent. The hands must be motorcycle gloves, though, as a minimum. The feet, sturdy footwear or work boots. As you can see, that's going to provide support and ankle protection for you. Um, these are examples of alternative clothing, but I'm going to tell you that they won't offer near the protection that properly designed motorcycle clothing is going to offer, and be aware of that. But the DVSA do have to offer alternatives for people that might not have the money to go out. Now obviously the helmet's not a, an alternative, you must have an, a proper approved helmet on, and it must be securely fastened as well, um, with a visor etc. But that is alternative clothing. I would not recommend it, if you're on a budget at all, I would recommend going out and like the Facebook and Facebook and all these kind of places and Gumtree, you'll be amazed at people that's wore gear once or twice, it's like new and they're selling it at a great price. So there you go, there's your uh, motorcycle gear, alright? And uh, uh, so a full head out kit, you're looking at least £300 plus for a full kit for your clone. Alright, so don't be surprised to be spending that sort of money to get yourself kitted out. Now we do motorcycle clothing here at ProScot and we also do a discount. But like everything, buy the best that you can afford. Remember when you're sliding down the road, that's when you wish you'd invested in um, good gear. Now this is the point where we'd go out and test your eyesight. Um, and we've got obviously the distance for the, the, the old style and we've got the distance of course for the new style number plate as well. And if we go back there you'll see the distance, 67 feet. Um, and 65 feet um, as you can see there for the new style plate all right and that concludes element a now as you can see there it's probably taken me about 40 minutes to rattle through that so you can see now why it can easily take 30 to 45 minutes to do section a but i give you all the information uh, what we do is we would do coaching with you now where we ask questions if you're giving us the right sort of answers we can see you've got the knowledge you've got the understanding we're not going to preach to the converted especially if you've come in as a cbt renewal when you're sitting there with all the gear on anyway what's the point of us laboring these kind of points to you but if you're coming as a complete novice hopefully my little presentation today has given you a better idea of why it's so important to get yourself pr pr properly protected on a motorbike and to give you an idea of the sort of clothing that you should be looking at getting yourself um, and hopefully then when you do come in to do your CBT that the instructor is going to be able to ask you the questions, get the relevant sort of answers and hopefully be through that in about typically 30 minutes. Okay, so thank you very much. Next one you're going to be looking at is element B where we're going to look at the motorcycle itself. Thank you. Over and out.